was blind and now it's true. Hello and uh, welcome to this week's episode of The Big Graham Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, liked, commented. Uh, your continued support is uh, is very much appreciated. Um, as you kind of know, uh, I'm not allowed to actually mention the company that I work for, um, but I'm kind of going to break the rules a bit today. Um, Basically, um, we have a monthly whiskey tasting, as you as you well know, and this this month's uh, September whiskey evening will take place on the twenty second. Now, um, I know there's about a week and a half still to go before the event, but up to, up till now, I've sold three tickets, um, and it's not going to be enough to uh, to have a, a worthwhile tasting. So, essentially, I'm I'm kind of asking all you guys that that live in Nottingham that watch that watch the show to to basically um, support the event. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, it's it's been really difficult over this last year or so, 18 months since when we hit lockdown to, to get enough people to basically make a viable whiskey tasting evening. And on some occasions I really had to sort of work quite, quite hard to sort of make sure there was a, a you know an interesting lineup of whiskies and when you don't have the bodies uh, and and the budget for the evening it's it's really difficult um so basically um i need to sell tickets i need ticket sales because uh, i don't want to cancel this month's um tasting evening and, and to be honest with you if it's going to carry on being this difficult and then I'm obviously going to have to question the viability of, of, of doing these these evenings. Um, so, yeah, basically, I'm, I'm kind of asking you to, A, support the company I work for, support me, because, you know, I enjoy doing these uh, these evenings. And, um, you know, let's let's keep them keep them going, because um, it would be a shame to uh, to 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 let the, the this fun evening go, to be honest with you. Anyway, so, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, you can purchase tickets uh, on the the company's website, and I, I really hope you do so. So anyway, on today to today's episode of the show. Um, well, you wait sort of four hundred odd episodes for an, for a Caden Heads tasting, and, and suddenly two come along at the same time. It's quite bizarre. But anyway, um, what happened was after doing the last uh, episode of the show, I was contacted by a chap called uh, Jason Julia, who s said, would you like some samples of more recent Cadenhead stuff? Well, does the Pope you know what in the woods is the answer to that? And well, I said, yes, that would be, be lovely. And he kindly sent me half a dozen samples, which was really, really kind. Now, um, Jason is otherwise known on uh, uh, Facebook by Nom de Plume, as they say, called Brora Rover, so, and I believe he also writes for Malt Review and uh, is, I, I assume, pretty well known by you guys. Um, so yeah, really, really big thank you. That's uh, and um, like I said in the last uh, episode of the show, where I reviewed a load of samples that uh, Guy kindly sent me. If you have samples of whiskies that you want me to review, doesn't have to be half a dozen; could be one or two. Um, feel free to sort of send them to me and you know I'll put them together and 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 do another sort of um, you know a viewers review episode of the show anyway so um, not really a great deal else to say apart from let's uh, let's have a look at today's lineup Worth a telephone, goodbye. right okay so first bottling we'll be looking at is a Glen Talkers this is bottled in the Cadenheads wood range um, it's a 10-year-old uh, Glen Talkers, uh, distilled in 2010, bottled in 2020, uh, spent um, a fair amount of time in Bourbon and uh, about sort of two years finishing in ex Manthania sherry cast, which is always cool. like to see other types of sherry cast used other than the ubiquitous Oloroso. Uh, number two is uh, a 15-year-old Dal Ewan. This is bottled in Cadenhead's Authentic Collection range uh, and was uh, bottled at 54.7%. Distilled in 2004, bottled in the spring of 2020. Uh, third bottling we'll be looking at, obviously you won't be able to see the colour because it's the black glass again. 
this is um, bottled in Cadenhead's Closed Distillery range. It's a, 20, a 33 year old Caledonian. Uh, it was distilled in 1987, bottled in the autumn of uh, 2020 and bottled at 43.9% and uh, I believe aged in ex-American oak. Uh, number four is uh, again another bottling in the authentic collection. This is a Dufftown Glenlivet, uh, 12 years old. Uh, it was um, distilled in 2007, originally put in bourbon casks and then transferred in 2018, August 2018 apparently, into Caribbean rum casks. Uh, it was just bottled in August of 2020 at 53.6%. Bottling number five uh, is um, a really intriguing bottling. This is bottled in uh, the Cadenhead's World Whiskey range and is a 24-year-old uh, Australian whiskey from the Tasmanian distillery Cradle Mountain, or otherwise known as Small Concern. Uh, distilled in, I believe, 1996 uh, and bottled in the spring of 2021 at 52.7% wholly aged in ex Cabernet Sauvignon cast. Now, um, apparently the distillery has quite a bit of an interesting history. Uh, it was founded in 1989 by a chap called Brian Pohl uh, uh, in uh, Ulverston in uh, northwest Tasmania. And um, it was always a, a small distillery and hence it was kind of nicknamed, I guess, a small concern. Uh, it changed its name at some stage uh, to the Franklin Distillery, which I think was after a, a strain of barley in actual fact. They then uh, took a sample to Cadenheads, um, and apparently that sample was about 15 months old, and Cadenheads were really, really impressed, and promptly purchased seven casks. And uh, trouble was, by the time Cadenheads purchased the cast, the distillery had, or the experiment as they called it had run its course, the distillery had been um, dismantled and that was the end of it. So allegedly Cadenheads uh, invested 25,000, I'm assuming pounds, um, no, 25 pounds, 25,000 pounds um, in, uh, in, in into the distillery uh, and it was rebuilt in 1994 or restarted in 1994 and promptly closed again in 1997 uh, due to the sort of like the uh, partially the, the obvious the worldwide uh, reduction in sales of, of whiskey per se but and what you have to understand is that not only did it affects Scotland, it also affected the rest of the world, and we certainly know it affected Japan, and apparently it affected uh, the Australian whisky industry as well, hence the distillery was, well, I don't know if it was closed or dismantled, I'm guessing from what I've information I've managed to glean, that it was probably mothballed, because I believe it was revived in 2001, then sold to another family, another guy called Joe Lahara in 2015, and then they planned to, uh, I believe, built a new distillery in 2018, and the, the distillery is obviously still, um, still in production. Now, um, interestingly, uh, again, doing my research, I had a quick look on um, uh, the whiskey database, uh, whiskey base. The apparently the, the seventh cask was uh, bottled as a 23-year-old in 2019. But this is a 24-year-old, and it was bottled last year. Something doesn't quite add up here. Then, um, how does you get eight bottlings out of seven casks? Um, so, looking at the information on whiskey base, the first cask was bottled in 2006 as a 10-year-old. Cask two bottled as an 11-year-old in 2007. Three as a 15-year-old in 2011. Now, in 2015. Dean, there were two bottlings of an 18 year old. Uh, one was in full size 70 CL bottles and the second was called um, cask ends and bottled in a 20 CL bottle. Now I think that those two bottlings were actually from the same cask so technically they were both from cask number four which makes cask number five 
a 21 year old which was bottled in 2017 cask 6 was the last one or what people believe to be the last cask bottled as a 23 year old in 2019 so this has to be cask number 7 uh, so the last of the stock uh, Caden Heads purchased way back and um, yeah I'm not a cheap bottling from uh, from what I've been reading so yes I'm really really grateful to um, Jason for that sample and the final sample uh, of today is uh, he's in the small batch range uh, two casks I believe or two barrels of uh, Tennessee whiskey which can only really be George Dickel uh, because I mean I've never seen a, a, an independent bottling of uh, any other Tennessee distillery uh, they just I mean and even so I, I, I can't remember the last time I actually saw a, a distillery bottling of, uh, uh, of Dickel it's as rare as hen's teeth uh, to be frank and um, it, I've always loved uh, Dickel and uh, so I'm really looking forward to this this is a 16 year old which was distilled in 2003 bottled in November of 2019 at 48.9% so lots of different styles different distilleries and uh, I think this is going to be a really intriguing uh, episode of the show so um, without much further ado let's kick off with the Glen Talkers right okay so let's kick off with the the first uh, bottling today the Glen Talkers uh, 10 year old uh, I've, I did forget to mention the fact that this is actually a bottle of 53.2 percent so Let's see what the nose gives us then, shall we? That's a lovely nose. Um, lots of Glen Talkers character, that crisp, granity, minerally uh, character that is, is just typical of Glen Talkers. And, and it's standing up to the sherry really well. The sherry has that lovely manthony, grapey kind of uh, dried fruit, um, lemon, honey, touch of orange. It's really nicely balanced. Yes, there's a lot of sherry character there, but Glen Talkers just has the, the, the cojones to kind of stand up to uh, um, sherry really, really well. I mean, I've only ever tasted a few bottlings where it's been completely obliterated by Oloroso, but more often than not, it really does have the intensity of character to, to uh, deal with sherry. Slightly herbal, slightly earthy. Um, touch of tannin yeah like I said that's a lovely nose so that's fine a little softer more honey more noticeable sherry more dried fruit lighter end of the spectrum dried fruit sultana dried grape that kind of thing on the mid palate citrus vanilla again the honeyed character is still kind of just sitting behind that that citrus and that minerally distillery character um good length uh, again a little bit of orange a little bit of um tangerine uh, a little bit of vanilla quite dry on the on the aftertaste it's a combination of the minerality and the alcohol um, let's put a little drop of water with it and see what um, what that does to it slightly sweeter a little bit more emphasis on the sherry now um, grapey dried fruit a little bit more orange just possibly a little floral as well um, okay so it's still a lovely nose it's not totally swamped the distillery character although the distillery character has kind of like lessened in its intensity. Let's see what that's like now. Very much the same. Still quite sherry orientated, slightly honeyed. Again, the sort of like the the minerality is backed off a bit although the citrus is still quite noticeable and, and gives that the finish a really nice freshness um, and stops it being overly sweet um, so yeah I think for a, for a, a sherry finish uh, absolutely gorgeous uh, and it just goes to show that a 
as long as the whiskey is balanced, um, I don't mind a bit of sherry. And certainly I love to see other sherry casks other than Oloroso use. So yeah, I thought that was, uh, that was a lovely bottle. Right, okay, so let's move on to the 15 year old Dal Ewan. Let's see what the notes gives us on this end, shall we? That's a bit raw and fainty, which is quite surprising given its age. Um, I'm guessing this was a pretty well used hoggy because uh, it really hasn't removed a, an awful lot of uh, um, faints from this spirit. I can tell you that for a start. Um, it's raw, it's oily, it's a bit vegetal. Um, it's really, it really shouldn't have been. Old. I mean, I think the thing, I think this could have been done with re-racking into a slightly more active cask, actually, because uh, there's no cask influence whatsoever, and like I said, it's, it certainly hasn't filtered out any of the um, impurities in this spirit. Um, I mean, I'm certainly not getting classic, meaty, sort of rich Dalyuan character. Um, it's, I wouldn't quite, I wouldn't say it's tight, um, but it's quite sort of, quite it's not citric it's it's you can smell the alcohol the, and um it's kind of like i said it's it's raw and a bit hard work as well anyway let's see what it sounds like I'd say it's going to try to tame throat out, but God, that's raw, raw, fainty, hot, um, no real character, slightly oily. There's maybe a little bit of barley, um, no oak uh, whatsoever. Um, let's try putting a little drop of water with it. Will that coax out a little bit of oak? Will that remove some of the faintiness? Mm, let's have a look and see. No, in actual fact, it's probably emphasised the faints, in actual fact. Um, any other character really has kind of just sloped off entirely. I mean, this this wasn't a bad... Well, no, this wasn't a bad whisky. is isn't a bad whisky, is the honest answer, except that the, it's, the, the oak hasn't done its job, uh, and really, this should have been re-racked. Um, e, a, to give it a bit of oak character, and B, just to sort of remove the faintiness and try and get some of that distillery character sort of out if it was ever going to come out. I mean, this was probably left for too long in reality. I mean, this should have been re-racked about five years ago, in, uh, I would have said. Um, anyway, let's see what passed by now. Yeah, n no real change. Raw, fainty, no fruit, no character, no nothing. It, it's just kind of alcohol really um, so yeah there's a bit of burnt cardboard right on the um, on the finish which is quite unpleasant has to be said yeah okay uh, next one I think right okay so let's move on to the 33 year old um, Caledonian let's see what the nose gives us on this end shall we that's quite a smoky nose lots of wood smoke um, good intensity, lots of sultana, dried citric, citrus fruit, lemon, vanilla, coconut. It's kind of, it's a classic, um, classic grain at the end of the day. Um, there's a bit of spice. It's showing a little bit of maturity. As we well know, grain whiskies really need a good 20 odd years in the cask, um, to sort of start showing some character. So... This is bottled at about the right age. It's still showing sort of a, a, a youthfulness in inverted commas. Um, getting a bit more coconutty now uh, with time. Yeah, that's that's a nice nose. It's it's not the most complex of grains that I've ever uh, had had my nose in the glass of, but yeah, it's nice. And like I said, got quite a lot of wood smoke. Let's see what that's like. Soft, mellow, quite juicy actually. Um, 
again, sort of that sultanery, sort of slightly rummy dried fruits, coconut, a little bit of spice, vanilla. Lovely depth to it. Um, has so much more going on for it after toasting that Dal Ewan. I mean, this is it's almost like a sort of, a, you know, um, feeling more complex than it probably actually is. Um, and this is often the thing when, you know, you taste whiskies in in succession and sometimes you know that they, they will inadvertently influence the, the whiskey that comes after it for one one way or another if you see what i mean and so i wouldn't say this is having tasted something like the dal Ewan, which is pretty raw yeah it kind of it is sort of giving it and no it's not giving it more than it actually has um oh, jesus christ i'm digging myself a right hole here aren't i let's just forget about what i've just said and let's just say it's a lovely grain okay Okay, uh, let's move on to one of my favourite distilleries. Yep, it's been a while since I've had a duffer. Um, so this is uh, ex-Caribbean rum cask finish. Let's see what the nose gives us then, shall we? Interesting. Um, right, yes, it's a bit spirity. It's a bit raw. Mm, yeah, kind of. Um, it's, it's kind of industrial it's duff town you know we're not expecting sort of you know um super smooth and gorgeous um but as i've often said with this style of whiskey it needs something else it needs a bit of sweetness uh, just to offset and the rum cask is doing exactly that um it's giving it a sort of starchy oily rummy dried fruit a little bit of gooseberry, so you know, a little bit of, of, of sort of distillery character you would want kind of coming through. Um, it's a bit odd, but it works if you can if you follow my logic on this one. Um, I wouldn't say I love it, um, but I don't sort of say I dislike it. It is it is what it is at the end of the day, um, and um, it it sort of works if you see what I mean. Let's see what the pass right now. Kicks off a plenty of distillery character. Sort of green fruit, classic space side, sort of gooseberry, a little bit of minerality, green citrus. It's a bit rough. Uh, there's an industrial characteristic that comes obviously through on the mid palate, there's a little bit of faintiness. Not quite as much rum cask as I was expecting. The rum cask really only starts to come through on the finish. A little bit of dried fruit. Um, there's some subtle, um, subtle tannins. There's some, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of American oak. Um, a little bit masked. Um, it's Whoa, it's a difficult one to love, it has to be said. Um, let's put a little drop of water with it and see if that makes um, a huge difference to this particular spirit. Oh dear. Um, oh, that's gone really soapy. Um, that, has, <laughs> that did not like adding water, I can tell you that for a start. Um, that is not gone. That's gone a bit peat tong, as they say. Um, right, <laughs> palette. Oh dear, um, wet cardboard and sugar. Ooh, my favourite. Um, yeah, that kind of really did not like water, it has to be said, which was a bit of a surprise. I was not expecting that. That was that came quite out of left field. Um, and, um, well, yeah, that's, it's stuff town, isn't it, I suppose? I mean, you know, what's, what's the saying? You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. I think that's very, very apt. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the Cradle Mountain 24-year-old. Uh, really looking forward to this. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Jesus Christ. Um, funky. 
Um, I can see why uh, why Caden Heads love this. Um, it's funky. It's herbal. It's huge, sort of slightly manure-y, earthy black fruit syrup. A bit of potpourri, a bit of sort of confected fruit, chocolate, edgy kind of slightly burnt oak. Jesus, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, um, it's interesting, okay? Um, I'll give it that. It's kind of, yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's no distillery character. I mean, I couldn't have, if I didn't know this came from Australia, I wouldn't have known where in the world this had actually come from. And, and it's kind of, it's almost sort of indicative of Australian whiskey, and they just seem to love these huge wine-influenced uh, spirits that, shall we say, lack subtlety and complexity and um, oh dear god am I sort of uh, you know let's, let's just insult an entire country while I'm at it shall I you know uh, I'll insult <laughs> I'm insulting the distillery the bottling company um, and Australia as well god dear god I'm doing well today aren't I um, no it's it's interesting okay um, I would have loved to have seen more distillery character I'd love to have known what the character of the spirit was all about but Frankly, I'm not going to get that. Um, I'm just getting sort of like, you know, funky, whiny, cabernet kind of strange, peppery, potpourri kind of, yeah. Let's see what the pass like. Yeah, funky, herbal, dark chocolate, bitter chocolate. I mean, the tannins are really bittering out the mid palate and the finish. Um, syrupy fruit, a little bit of earth, a little bit of cardboard as well. Um, short, masked, potpourri, sort of weird, slightly confected finish. I mean, it is, frankly, a bit of a car crash, it has to be said. I mean, it's kind of like strangely appealing if you see what I mean um, again no distillery character it's all cask orientated it's weird it's funky I love it um, I wouldn't want to have paid a hundred and something odd pounds for it and if you have just stick it in your collection and sell it in a few years um, let's see what some water does to it is it going to go the way of the uh, of the Duff Town, uh, or are we going to get a sudden revelation? Um, well, let's let's see then, shall we? Not really. Um, it's it's kind of dialed down some of the funkiness. It has to be said. Um, it's a little bit more chocolatey. There's a sort of a dusty chocolatey kind of character now. Um, Quite again, quite herbal. It sort of reminds me a little bit of um, Langerton with that almost kind of Provençal-y, herby kind of character. But um, again, no, no distillery character. Let's see what the pass on. It's a little softer, a little less bitter. Um, still quite drying, still quite tannic, um, no real, real length to it, it's still quite short, it's kind of, you know, just really, it's just too cask orientated at the end of the day, and what do you expect, they spent 24 years in the next Cabernet saving on cask, you know, it's like, we're not going to get any finesse here, are we guys? Um, so yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't have parted with over a hundred and something odd pounds for it personally, but there you go. Right, okay, and on to the final whiskey of the day. This is the um, small batch Tennessee whiskey. Let's see what uh, the nose gives on this one, shall we? Mm, 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 nothing like saving the best till last. Um, it's a bit reserved in actual fact. Um, dark marzipan, corn, plenty of grippy rye spices, um, some smoked almond, earth, sweet vanilla. There's a buttery note as well. I mean, that's a 
stunning nose. I mean, it really is gorgeous. Um, I love the intensity. I love that rye intensity, that dark rye intensity. Um, but it's balanced. It's not just all about the rye. There is some soft, sweet vanilla and sweet corn, all just kind of sitting in the background, just giving it a bit of a bit of body. Uh, it's a bit of tobacco smoke. I just got. A, Mm. Yeah, just a lovely whiff of tobacco smoke. Um, that is just frankly a stunning whiskey. Um, it just goes to show you how how damn good that distillery is. And, and I just wish I could get my hands on some of this stuff. Um, but I can't. It's just a really, really frustrating, it has to be said. Um, anyway, let's see what passes on. That's gorgeous. Fresher than the nose would suggest. A little bit more citrus to kick off with and then in comes that sort of slightly sweet corn. But that citrus, um, almost citrus acidity, is kind of all going right the way through the palate. So it kind of like keeps it really fresh and you get a little bit of a peanut brittle, a bit of cigar smoke, uh, vanilla, oily barley, rye spice, dark spice. Um, marzipan, oak, um, and, and slight pepperiness. I mean, oh, the spices on the end of that are just absolute to die for. They are gorgeous. Um, bit of chocolate powder as well. I mean, it is just so, so complex and so contained and balanced and just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it is everything that I'm afraid the, the Duff Town and uh, the the, uh, the Tasmanian whiskey weren't. I mean, it is just absolutely stunning. Oh, I'd like to end on a high note. Okay, so let's sum today's uh, episode of the show up. Well, at least I've kind of not uh, insulted the uh, the Americans, which is kind of good, I suppose. Um, anyway, um, the Glen Talkers, lovely whiskey, really, really nice. Um, like I said, when I tasted it, Glen Talkers has that innate characteristic of that really crisp, granity character, which really stands up to sherry uh, amazingly well and that that really was very very good um, the uh, the Dal Ewan uh, was a real disappointment uh, like I said uh, it, it had obviously been aged in a, an unactive cask a very very well used cask and really should have been re-racked um, many many years ago to at least you know act as a filter and or just add some vanilla just add something to just distract from that rawness um the uh the caledonian yeah lovely grain whiskey um if you purchased a bottle of that then you certainly got a lovely whiskey and you know i've nothing else really much more to say about it um the duff town well it certainly hasn't sort of changed my opinion of the distillery itself the distillery is you know a fully paid up member of the Axis of Evil and I can never see that one actually changing. I mean, it it was, it was just odd. Um, I mean, yeah, all right, the nose was okay. You know, the rum sweetness kind of counteracted the inherent sort of industrial character of the, um, of the spirit. Um, palette was all right. I mean, I could have just about lived with that and then you stick some water with it and it really fell apart. Um, it's been a long time since I've had a spirit um, that has fallen apart that badly, shall we say. So um, apologies to Caden Heads, but really that was not a very good bottling whatsoever. Um, the uh, small concern, I really wanted that to be so much better than what it was, and it's a real disappointment at the end of the day. Um, you know, you're tasting a bit of history, a bit of history that's never going to be repeated, and it was just horribly disappointing. Um, and... I'm afraid life is indeed full of disappointment. So again, many apologies to Cadenheads, uh, but that, no. 
On the other hand, though, um, praise where praise is due. And like I said, I've always said, you will, you know, I will give you an honest review. You give me a spirit. I'm not going to sugarcoat the, um, the review whatsoever. I'm not going to basically kowtow or pander to anybody. These are all my personal opinions. You may well agree. You may well disagree. Um, that's the wonderful thing about whiskey. But that Dickel was stunning, absolutely stunning. And, you know, I don't know how much that retailed for, but, you know, if you picked up a bottle of that, then you've got a gorgeous whiskey, it has to be said. And, uh, like I said, um, a lovely way to end this uh, episode of the show. So, there you go. Um, in, the reality is that Cadenheads are no different to any other independent bottling company. Some good bottlings, some indifferent bottlings, and some rubbish bottlings at the end of the day. And every independent has exactly the same. Um, and, you know, sometimes you sort of think they're obviously bottling it maybe because they have to. Um, there are obviously uh, financial implications and pressures to bottle certain things. And certain things you taste and you think, well, they really shouldn't be bottled. And this is this is why I always insist on getting samples, because you just don't know. You know what the distillery is like, you know roughly that kind of thing, but of course single cast bottlings are always going to be different, they're always going to throw you a bit of a curveball. And you know, if you're gonna come into the shop where I work and you're gonna to want to, to purchase a bottle, you're gonna to want to know that A, I've tasted it, and B that it's past my quite stringent criteria um, otherwise it ain't going to get on the shelf at the end of the day and uh, I make no apologies for that because I am on the side of the consumer because I am a consumer at the end of the day I buy whiskey and I don't want to buy whiskey that is disappointing and you guys don't want to buy whiskey that's disappointing um, so yeah I make no apologies for that but again a big thank you to Jason for uh, these samples. Uh, I hope you found this uh, um, review entertaining. I hope you guys have all found this ent entertaining because that's obviously what I'm here to do. So anyway, until uh, next uh, next week, um, good ramming and good afternoon. Oh, and don't forget to buy a bloody ticket for the, the whiskey tasting, all right? Do it, because mm. I said so. I'm